Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here. Joining me today is Jeremiah Vernon, who is the farmer at Vernon Family Farm in Newfields, New Hampshire. Jeremiah is a 10th generation New Hampshire native. He grew up in New London, New Hampshire on his family farm on Pine Gree, Pingree Road, and has always had a love for animals in the outdoors. He received his Bachelor of Science from Bates College, earning a degree in biology. Their farm are operation focuses on growing non-GMO chicken, which they sell through several channels, including their farm store, which is a local one-stop shop. Hey, Jeremiah, welcome. Hey, thank you very much for having me. So talk to me a little bit about uh, the farm. It, it, you seem to be doing a lot. You focus on growing just chickens. So talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So um, as you mentioned, I grew up in New London, New Hampshire. And uh, I grew up on my family's land. They, we settled, uh, we came over with the Pilgrims. So we settled the land fairly early on in uh, America's history. Okay. And I spent my childhood days exploring the woods uh, and absorbing, observing animals. And uh, especially with Audubon, both my parents and my grandparents were involved with Audubon. So I did a lot of birding trips and nature okay. walks and just fell in love with animals in the outdoors. And that sort of prompted me to convince my parents to get everything from chickens to turkeys, sheep, goats. Uh, I describe it like your typical New England backyard farm. Uh And uh, we did everything from processing on the farm to, you know, having chicks and birthing lambs and everything else. And um, I was always involved with all of it, whether it was the processing or any other part. And uh, through that experience, I carried that knowledge with me. And in high school, I did a one week long, like intensive lambing program. And then at Bates College um, in Lewiston, Maine, there was a large organic dairy farm down the road that had a restaurant on it. Oh, very cool. And yeah, it was great. We'd go there for breakfast and I was always always enamored with the place, um, all the activity, the life. And I worked there after college for two years and have been farming ever since. Um, And then five years ago, we bought our farm. So worked as a farmhand on a number of different farms for years. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that experience, because I run into people that want to, you know, come from corporate America and start farming the next year. Would you recommend that aspect of working at other farms first? I would definitely recommend that aspect. We run into that here as well. Um, Our farm's located in a relatively affluent community. So we do have folks that are sort of coming from corporate, buying up land and looking Mm -hmm. to start farming. And uh, yeah, I mean, farming, like any career, is not something that you just want to jump into. I think it's something you want to have some experiences with learning from folks who have been doing it for longer than you have and have more knowledge than you do and Uh share that knowledge with you. So I worked on a variety of farms, um, a diversified organic dairy farm in Maine. That was the Nazinscott farm. Yep. For New England standards, it was relatively large. We had about a thousand cows. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is large. Yeah. And um, so it was a really unique experience uh, working in the fields, you know, bringing crops in. And then I did a uh, relatively large greenhouse uh, tomato operation, and that was a conventional grow. And then I worked for University of New Hampshire's organic dairy farm. And uh, then also after that, a sheep and goat farm. And after that, we bought our farm. Oh, wow. So four different farms. Was that uh, greenhouse operation backyard gardens or backyard farms? No, it was Spring Ledge Farm. They're also okay. located in New London, New Hampshire. And yeah, they have a, an incredible location. They're right in downtown and they have a thriving operation there. Very cool. So talk to me about buying your farm. What were you looking for when you decided to buy your land? It was a seven-year process, um, you know, developing a business plan, soliciting funding. We did our funding through the Farm Service Agency and yep. Farm Credit East. And my wife is a Spanish teacher at Exeter High School, which is the local public high school in the district we live in. So we wanted to find a farm in that district. Mm -hmm. Um, So that kept us sort of centered on the seacoast of New Hampshire and narrowed our search. The positives of the seacoast are that we're close to a large customer base, uh, a large affluent customer base, but the land prices here are quite expensive. Yeah. So um, I was working at this Riversley farm, which was the sheep and goat farm, and we drove past a 33 acre farm with a sale for sale sign up and we pulled into the driveway, took a look around, called the agent. And 
we were fortunate that the house it was in pretty rough condition so mm -hmm. it drove the value way down yeah and as farmers we were more interested in the land than we were the house so we were able to get it for uh you know a really competitive price considering the location and yeah we've been here for we bought it in 2014 very cool. Now, talk to me a little bit about um, getting onto the land, that process, because setting up a new farm is always can be challenging. There's so much to do. What was your like mindset going into that? And what were the things you focus, focused on setting up first? Sure. Yeah. So when I worked at Rivers Lee Farm, their farm was located in the same community as the farm we bought. And okay. I ran their farmer's markets for them. So I had access to, you know, the, the knowledge of seeing what customers were buying at the farmer's markets. Yeah. And while I was doing that, we noticed that there was really no one doing pastured poultry. You could get, you know, some frozen broilers here and there, but there was yeah. no one that had boneless breast or thighs or drumsticks or chicken sausage or any of these other things that, you know, chicken is the most consumed protein in the world. So mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. So when we started our farm, um, we actually started on leased land at Rivers Leaf Farm. We did 1,200 pastured chickens that year, mm -hmm. and we sold them all no problem. So wow. we just kept sort of pushing that and pushing that, and that was the foundation of our production when we bought our farm. So we already had a bit of a customer base established. We had taken out a micro loans. So we had a little bit of money to get started. And, you know, when we started, though, it was – PVC pasture pens and mm -hmm. bags of grain and wheelbarrows and a lot of sweat equity. Um, my wife maintained her off farm job and still does. And that was obviously a huge support to get mm -hmm. us started. The farm we purchased is located on a fairly busy road. So without having to do a tremendous amount of work, we could get customers pulling in just to mm -hmm. see what we were doing. And that was also key to sort of help generate that startup cash flow. Yeah. So now do you have like a water over the entire farm with piping or are you still hauling it? What's that situation look like? We have grown uh, very quickly, which is both stressful and wonderful at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, we started, so in 2014, we did 1,200 chickens. Yep. And now we do 20,000 a year. Um, oh, wow. And that growth has required you know, the purchases of a lot more equipment. We have, you know, grain silos now and tractors yeah. and trucks. And so now we have big mobile grain carts and water carts that we can truck around and tractor around out into the field. So we've really reduced the amount of handwork we do mm -hmm. a lot more equipment focused now, which is, uh, you know, as far as the efficiencies go, payroll and longevity of us being able to operate this farm has been key. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does a typical day look like for you on the farm? So I will say that as part of the result of growing so quickly is that those typical days change very quickly as well. Absolutely. One thing that happened, uh, which was a positive for us, is we already had one child uh, who was only about a year and a half old when we bought the farm. Okay. And then our second daughter was born within six months of buying the farm. And that required us to get an employee from day one. I just mm. couldn't afford the time to disappear into the farm. I needed to be and wanted to be a, a dad and family member. Mm -hmm. So having that foundation, um, it's just, I think, an important background that we've always had an employee since day one. So a typical day on the farm for us, uh, you know, it was basically when we started was a you know, make it up as you go. I'd walk outside, my employee would be there and we would decide what we're going to do. Yeah. Now we have systems in place. We have a full farm calendar and schedules and, you know, everything else. And our employees have a lot more structure and focus. Mm -hmm. So our, we do our chores in the morning. Chores include feeding, watering, bedding, and moving chickens. Yep. And that whole process, we have about 6,000 birds on the farm at any given moment. We've gotten that down to, a, you know, a two-hour process at most. And then the rest of the day is spent, you know, mostly sanitizing and maintenance, just cleaning, uh, fixing up equipment, doing minor repairs, preparing for market, you know, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Do you do on-farm processing? No, we don't. Um, we, so, you know, New Hampshire and New England is obviously a very small state. Mm -hmm. And for us to cross state borders with our product, we need to have that USDA inspection. Uh, and yep. um, we weren't prepared to open a USDA processing facility when we started. And, well, we're still not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So we use Commonwealth poultry in Gardner, Maine. So we truck our birds up there to get processed. And that allows us to sell both across state borders and the two major metropolitan cities near us also require USDA inspection. Okay. And one of those, going back to the Rivers Lee, one thing we noticed when we were doing the farmer's markets is not a single farmer was doing USDA inspected poultry. So there was no yeah. chicken being sold in the both the two of the strongest farmer's markets and restaurant markets in the state. So when uh, okay. we started with that USDA inspection, we very much had, we had one, we had little to no local farmer competition. And um, we had an already customer base to buy that product. So how far of a trip is that for you to haul the birds? It's about two hours from the okay. farm to the processing facility, which, you know, it sounds like a long time, but, you know, compared to a lot of farms, we are very lucky. Yes, to have absolutely. A yeah. processing facility that close. So talk to me about the actual mechanics of like getting the birds there. Do you load them into like chicken crates and then stack them and then drive them? Um, do you do it at night? Yeah, so that's a good question. So one thing we've learned um, is sort of as a background of that is scale matters. So the processing facility requires a minimum of 200 birds per process. Yeah. So that was also sort of pushing us as we go. We wanted to make sure we stayed ahead of the processing facility so that as they grew, we could continue to match their minimum um, mm -hmm. amount of birds. Um, so we do all of our chicken, I would say moving, minus moving the pasture pens at night when the birds are as calm as possible. Mm -hmm. And we load them into um, chicken crates, which are on pallets, and then we pallet six, uh, 12 crates at a time onto the truck okay. and strap them down. And then we drive to the processing facility. We leave around four in the morning in order to do it at night when the birds are mm -hmm. calm and also in the summer when it's less hot. And then, uh, yeah. Okay, very cool. Let's talk about building the business because you've scaled rapidly. I know there's always uh, growing pains as you do that scale. How do you build the systems? What systems have you put in place to ensure that you focus on the most vital priorities each day? Yeah. So um, to, to be honest with you, the first two or three years, it was sort of a shotgun approach. We just were reacting to whatever seemed to be happening. Mm -hmm. And it was around year four, which was the beginning of last year, that we really had some clarity in we're a pastured poultry farm and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. So to get there required, um, like I said, going into debt with some microloans. Um, but we focused a lot on what are those products that we consume on the farm in large quantity and what are ways that we can reduce the cost of those. So instead of going from bagged feed, you know, we went to bulk feed. Mm -hmm. And that required grain, car grain silos and grain carts, but it also eliminated a tremendous amount of waste and labor. So we've done all of our improvements based off the calculation on labor. How much labor does it cost us now? Would this piece of equipment offset what mm -hmm. we would be paying for labor? And that has been, you know, a very, I think, e relatively direct way of figuring out where we're going to spend our money and where we're going to grow the business. On Yeah. That's all on the production side. The marketing side for us has been fortunately one of the easier aspects of the farm. We are in an affluent area. We have a ready knowledgeable customer base, customer base. And we also have a regional distributor that focuses on pastured products. Okay. And they pay a fairly competitive price for chicken. So they have been really driving demand in the wholesale market for us. And we, we can't keep up with that demand. So that has been really pushing the farm to continue to grow. And yeah. So how much bigger can you get on those 33 acres with chickens? Because they lay down a lot of nitrogen. Yeah, that's a good question. So we, you know, we do soil tests every year in our fields. When we bought the farm, it had been hayed once a year for the last mm -hmm. 30 years with no nutrients put down on it. So our fields are very nutrient poor to begin with. So by our estimates, we still have about another five years before we'll start having too much nutrients in our fields. Okay. We've also started leasing another, there's a 90 acre farm across the street that we lease now. Okay, and gotcha, yep. Yeah, we're running most of our pasture, our meat birds over on that farm. And then on our 33 acre farm, we run our egg layers. Okay, gotcha. So now you just have the meat birds on the egg layers. And how big are you with the egg layers? How many birds are there? That is just a startup phase. We, we have about 150. Okay. Um, and we're looking to scale that up to about a thousand, but we're probably two years out from that. Yeah. Right now it's figuring out all the kinks. Correct. Yeah. You know, what kind of layer boxes, what kind of pasture pens we want to use for them? What's their winter housing going to be? 
how do we keep water lines from freezing all winter? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. all yep, yep, all of those questions. Talk to me a little bit about your climate. How cold do you get in the winter? Well, that's um, that's that's been changing um, as the climate does change. <laughs> yes. Um, so right now we have these uh, little temperature and humidity probes that we keep sensors that we keep in the barns to see how, what's happening out there. And I believe the lowest we got in the barn this year was 15 degrees, which is really not that cold. No. Um, we don't do any meat birds in the winter, so it's only keeping water to the 150 egg layers. And we just do that with some simple floor waterers and a couple mm -hmm. heaters. So that's, that's been pretty basic. But we've definitely had heat problems in the summer. Yeah. And that is something that uh, last year we had a heat stroke come through our pasture birds and we lost 400 of the 3,500 that were in the field. Whoa. Yeah. And that was a devastating day. Um, it was not a day that snuck up on us. I mean, we had prepared for it. We were watering down the huts. We had removed the feed during the day yeah. to reduce their daytime metabolism. We're only feeding them at night. We had put electrolytes in the water, et cetera, but it just was so hot that the birds still died from the heat. So now we have fans that are actually mounted in our pasture pens, and we have generators that will hook up when necessary to just keep the air moving over the pens. And we're also going to start reducing our stocking density in the heat of the summer okay. just to give the birds all more space as well. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we're, you know, as we move forward, we're continually thinking about how we can improve the yeah. infrastructure and the conditions for our birds have you also count. missed it as well you have a misting system you can set up uh not yet but we're putting some new uh you know those 300 gallon uh water cubes yep mm -hmm. we're mounting one of those on each of our pasture pens and then there'll be a little solenoid and a solar panel that'll operate a mister line oh very and that'll cool. all be yep. temperature driven so yeah we're getting there with that right now it's just the fans but misters is where we're going to go with all of it for sure very interesting. I'd love to see pictures when that's all set up and, and done. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be pretty slick. We'll only have to water and feed once a week versus every day. Um, oh, wow. Upgrades. Yeah, so it's, I think we estimated just the watering is going to be, you know, roughly a $25,000 a year savings of labor. Um, so that's, that's huge. Wow. All right. So talk to us about the hardest thing that you have ever done as a farmer. Oh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> The, the balance of farming and life is, I think, a continual challenge and has been the hardest thing for us. Yeah. We were, we were fortunate enough in the beginning to identify a market, and we've done a good job growing within that market. And we've needed to figure out how that growth and that demand for our product balances with what we need in our life and time away from the farm, financial requirements. And we don't have that perfectly figured out. I do take a day off, sometimes two, uh, every week in the summer. And um, in the winter, it's much slower, obviously. So I, I, we don't have a perfect formula for that time off versus on farm. But I do think that the farm life balance is a continual challenge. And I'm sure it's not just for us. Yeah. So talk to me about some of the things you've implemented to try to make that work-life balance better. Yep. Um, so having good employees is, I think the first thing we've done, we've had, we have an incredible crew. We compensate our crew, uh, financially with food, they get paid time off. You know, we try to do a lot to keep them around so we don't have to keep training new crew. Yeah. And that has been huge. We have what, four returning employees this year. So the amount of training and time needed to get people up and running is substantially less. And that has been key to um, having a, that better work-life balance. The other thing we, knew, we do now is we have a full farm calendar. So that includes everything from on-farm events to the day chicks arrive to the day the barn gets cleaned out. So mm. you don't wake up in the morning and ask yourself, what do you do? You just do what's on the calendar that day. Yeah. And that has been taking that decision-making out of it and having that amount of focus has been really great for eliminating the mental stress or reducing the mental stress associated with running the farm. Okay, so is that a Google calendar? Is that a physical calendar? How do you set that up? We use a physical, we have a farm office and we use a physical calendar to sort of set the season up. And then we download that physical calendar um, just by punching it in onto a Google calendar that's shared with all the employees. Yep. And then we also, there, um, we use T-sheets for all of our scheduling and then their schedule on T-sheets reflects the demands of the farm. So if we have an event that's going to 8 p.m. on a Friday, they know 
you know, when they, in the beginning of the summer, that the third yeah. Friday in August, they have to stay till 8 p.m. So we yeah. try to keep that very much ahead of time. And that way, when we take, when people take times off, et cetera, all that is built in around those sort of no vacation days that we have on the farm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Who would you say your mentors have been over the years? Every farm I've ever worked on. I mean, I, I would highly recommend if you're interested in farming, work on farms and just keep your eyes open and observe. Farmers are incredibly thrifty. They're incredibly creative. And I've just learned so much by watching, you know, for example, I was uh, bringing in hay on that dairy farm in Maine. Yeah. And uh, I was a novice and one of the um, tie rods on the front axle of the tractor broke. Oh, and in my head, it was like, oh, my gosh, this day is done. But my boss came over with his pickup truck, jacked the tractor up, welded it back together. And I think within half an hour, I was raking hay again. Yeah. And that moment for me, I, I'll never forget that moment. That was just like, wow, you can do that. <laughs> you can do it <laughs> yes. Like that. And uh, so that's very important. Um, Rivers Lee Farm, the farm I worked on before we purchased our farm, they were very kind and would share their books with us. So I got mm-hmm. to see what their profit margins were, where they were spending their money, um, what their cash flow stresses looked like. And having that knowledge was, um, was very helpful because it gave me some bearing and understanding of, you know, if I'm in this much debt, but my income is this, there's some comparable there that I could look at. And that was important. And I, I encourage farmers to share more of that information because I think it's helpful for all of us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. All right. So there's something you said right there, cash flow, um, which is so key. And just the welding. I mean, just knowing how to weld, I think, is a, 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 a class every single farmer should take. Completely. And, yeah. It's like taking a caulking gun that has liquid metal and basically doing whatever the heck you want with it. It is. Yeah. And there's so many custom fabrication moments on your farm. You know, you have you just want to weld a hook onto something to hang a five gallon bucket when you're driving around in the field. I mean, there's so many simple things mm-hmm. that can become so helpful. What brand and size of welder do you have? Well, I would be, uh, I don't actually have one. So my, one of my employees has a welder, so he just does it him. I just have him do it. <laughs> Perfect. Hey, that's even better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing we did not do when we started was a SWOT analysis. And, yes. uh, I, that's, <laughs> That's something I would highly recommend that you do when you get started, because it's really important to figure out where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are Mm -hmm. and and then what you're going to do about them. Yeah, a a little funny story is uh, we had a farmer actually in Maine, um, Kelby Young, who I don't know if you know him. Um, He does pastured pork and some vegetables. Okay. um, Up near Augusta, I believe. It's like an hour or so south of Augusta. I think that's where he is. Anyway, he he bought a walk-in freezer out here in Ohio. And um, he was going to get shipped and it just didn't work out. So he said, okay, I'm going to drive the 13 hours or 14 hours. And as he got close, his uh, something broke on his trailer. So he calls me up. And he's like, Michael, do you have a welder? And I'm like, I do. So we ended up, he backed the trailer into my garage and uh, he spent the next couple hours welding it back together. And it held all the way back to Maine, which was amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. No, no. I think I agree. Welding is a welding one hundred and one is a, t- a class we should all take. Yeah. So talk to me about the the cash flow because that can always be challenging. Are you, um, you know, kind of like laying people off in the fall and then like shutting things down as the the growing season ends, or how do you manage that? So we have, as far as employees go, we have two year round salaried employees that are okay. here. Um, we they work more hours in the summer and less in the winter to balance mm-hmm. a 40 hour work week. And so that, and then we also have seasonal employees that we do lay off every, uh, the beginning of November every year. Um, as far as cash flow goes, the most important thing we did to stabilize our cash flow was hire a bookkeeper mm-hmm. and a bookkeeper was able to, you know, help us just manage when we're going to pay those bills and when we're not and how that's all going to go. And that was really important. We also have a line of credit that we use to do our spring startup costs. And then we just pay that off by the fall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having that access to that capital and then also someone with the knowledge to help you manage how you're going to spend your money and where it's going to go were the two most important things we did for cash flow. Mm. The, The other thing is we had this growth in our pastured poultry business. When we first started, when we bought our farm, we had you know, three quarters of an acre of veggies. We had mush, we grow, we grew shiitake and oyster mushrooms. We had the pasture birds, we had pastured pork. And 
it was we were not my, my brain us, our, our you know my family we were we were not capable of growing each of those enterprises yeah um, in a profitable way so as far as cash flow goes we know we basically had to shed those enterprises to reduce our cash flow stress because mm. we weren't making enough money in the season to have enough money in the spring to you know buy all the grain we needed or whatever was needed to start up the season so part of the reality of that cash flow was figuring out what's making you money and what's not and get rid of those things that are not making you money. And that sounds simple, but as you know, it's, it's harder <laughs> yes, than you think to is. identify on a farm. So, uh, so you cut out the mushrooms, you cut out the pork. Um, did some, did you, did you sell those operations or just like shut them down and, um, move on? We just shut them down and moved on. Um, mm. there is, there has been this growing trend around, um, the seacoast of New Hampshire, in my opinion, the farms that seem to be sort of rising to the top are the farms that have found one aspect of their production that they're exceptionally good at, and they've focused a tremendous amount of in resources and time on mm -hmm. improving the efficiency of that production. So there's a fairly large pasture pork farm near us, and that's all they do. I mean, they have like six heads of beef cow, but you know, all they do is pastured pork. Yeah. There's vegetable farms near us all they do are vegetables we do chicken there's a beef operation and those farms seem to you know year after year you see them making the improvements they're putting up a new barn they're buying a new tractor and i think that diversification on a farm is important it's got to be diversification with intention it just can't yeah. be diversification for the sake of it and even if you are diversifying identifying something that you're really good at and making sure that that is your you know your cornerstone product the thing that people come to you for and that you have the volume to meet that demand. I, I think that was really important. And that seems to be what a lot of the farms around here are doing to mm -hmm. um, become more sustainable is finding a product, getting really good at producing it and trying to get that product out into a greater customer base. Absolutely. And with that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back for the rest of the episode. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. Hey, we're back with Jeremiah Vernon from Vernon Family Farm. Talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, if you were to start over again, if you were to go back to that first day you set foot on the farm when you purchased it, what systems would you go back and put in place sooner? I would have, I, well, first off, I would have done a better job of identifying what I'm good at and capable of doing yeah. versus uh, just sort of, I want to grow veggies, I'm going to start growing veggies. Um, so I think that there was, I should have been a little bit more focused on not over diversifying in that first stage. Okay. And I, I would have gone back and been a little bit more system oriented with one product versus trying to implement a bunch of different products and product lines all at once. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, looking back on my beginning self, there was a, you know, sort of a naivete of I'm going to be a veggie grower, a pasture pork grower, and a, you know, all of these different things. And mm -hmm. that was, um, you know, that was not possible, at least for us. And uh, the other thing I would say, looking back is, it was, we, we did, we, I think we did a good job in general. So I don't have an over criticism. I think we were a fairly focused, you know, we still, that pastured poultry piece was already established when we bought our farm from those two years of leasing a farm in Rivers Lee. So yeah. we had that little bit of something going. And we did it, we were very fortunate to find a piece of property that matched what we wanted to do with the location, et cetera. So 
I don't really actually honestly have too much sort of constructive criticism for myself back then. I think what I didn't know, I wouldn't have known <laughs> um, yeah. until now either way. Mm -hmm. One shortcoming is I spent 10 years prior to purchasing our farm being a farmer, but never being a business owner. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of farmers, that is the case. And you cannot ignore the importance of running your farm as a business versus just your, your curiosity with how you grow chickens. And yeah, I should have paid, paid more attention to that in the beginning. I think we'd be in a better place than we are now. We're not in a bad place at all, but I think we would have been even in a better place if that had been more of a focus at the beginning. Yeah, I think there's that huge difference between what you could call a grower or a technician and what you call a farmer or an entrepreneur. Because the farmer slash entrepreneur is the one who's managing that farm business, whereas a grower usually can just be hired to actually do the actual work. Correct, yeah. And those are two, and running a business is, um, is a is a unique and completely time absorbing uh, activity in itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's move on and talk about your team. You just mentioned them earlier that that's a key aspect of your growth and as you being successful. How do you divide roles on the farm? So we sort of divide roles up based off of production versus marketing. Okay. So we have our 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 overall we have a farm manager. And he does oversee the marketing a little bit, but 90% of his efforts are spent on the production side of the farm. Mm -hmm. So he's year round on salary and, um, you know, we pay them well for uh, being a farmer and we also provide four weeks paid vacation. And, you know, we had to work up to this level of yeah. compensation, um, but that has been key to keeping a good team around. And I think a lot of farmers don't give enough, uh, compensation to their employees, both because they can't afford to, or because they think that their employees are also going to just be as passionate as they are. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a dangerous game. When we ask our employees to do hard work and in inclement weather and get paid very little to do it, you're, you're going to have a lot of trouble maintaining uh, a positive employee on your farm. Mm -hmm. So we've done a lot, even when we couldn't afford to pay our employees well, we've done a lot with compensation in the form of food, um, or, you know, we'll do like, we'll just on a hot day, we get the chores done and then we'll just take everybody to the beach to go for a swim. You know, it sounds simple, but those little investments in your employees can make a huge difference to the quality of the workplace. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's something really interesting. I want to ask further about. So you take them to the beach, you do other things like that. Do you ever feel there's a point that you can get too close to an employee and, and, and kind of like change that, like a boss, I don't like to call it boss. I call it like leader follower, or you think that as long as you build those relationships, well, you can be really close. That's a good question. That is something I am learning as we go here. Uh, I am by nature a more of a friend than a boss. Yeah. And so, I struggle with um, that too. Yes. And I, well, I will say this. I don't have anybody working on the farm that I don't like. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I like all my employees quite a bit and I think yeah. they like me as well. And so I, I, I do think that formality is something that we're balancing. And I have decided that that formality needs to come mostly in the structure of when they work and what their responsibilities are. But then within the, within that role, those roles, we try to have the interactions be much more sort of uh, friendly, yeah. um, friend based. I will say our employees, and I think like many, our employees are all millennials. And I think like many millennials, they want to have an idea of why their work matters to the larger picture. Yeah. So we've spent a lot of time on sort of trying to explain why, you know, the height of a feeder in the pasture pen matters in the big picture of the farm. And, Interesting. And sharing that. And that's something as simple as just team meetings where we talk about when we have team meetings, we basically try to highlight one aspect of the farm. And we just spend 20 minutes talking about it. So if it's feeders, we'll spend 20 minutes talking about feeders and feeder heights, et cetera. And then tying that into the, goal of the whole picture of the farm has added a lot of depth to every task because something as simple as a five gallon bucket and filling a feeder can be relatively brainless. But when you consider how it's impact, how that impacts oh, yeah. the health of the bird and the productivity of that bird and therefore the productivity and the profits of the farm and how much that employee then can get paid, that becomes a much more comprehensive understanding. So, Absolutely. Yeah. 
Interesting. Because I remember, obviously, I interned at Polyface, so f I filled a lot of feeders. And there was, you know, if you did the technique right, you could fill an entire feeder. But if you weren't doing the technique right, you were spilling it on either side of the feeder. And then that was losing efficiency. And then you were wasting feed. And then obviously, you know, that would show up in the books in about a month or so. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're talking about, you know, low net profits, which farming is, you have to be aware of every detail because that's where your net profits lie. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that I've learned since we started is that, you know, if you're really trying to get your farm to go from, you know, a three to 4% net profit to something over 10%. And ideally I think farms should be around 25%. If mm -hmm. things, and I, I think that that's, you're, you're in the detail world if you're trying to get to that 25%. And something as simple as filling a feeder has that effect. Absolutely. So how did you find these employees? So our farm is fortunately located right next to the University of New Hampshire, which has okay. ag program. And we have done a lot to cultivate a relationship with UNH. So mm -hmm. whether it's um, giving talks in classes, um, joining for their job fairs, networking with professors, that's how we found all of our employees. Awesome. So do you have like specific roles on the farm or like the people that are on, it's more like um, just, you know, there's the tasks that need done and everyone just kind of like envelops them. No, we do have specific roles. And one thing that we've started doing every year, regardless of whether or not it's a returning employee or not, is rewriting everybody's job description. Interesting. And I think that has been a huge positive, both for my mental space of like, what are we doing on this farm and who's doing it? And it's been very helpful for the employees to sort of see written down, here's uh, the roles and responsibilities that your job includes. And we try to keep it fairly specific. There are always crossover days and we prefer to have crossover days. I think it adds a comprehensive understanding for every employee if they get a chance to work in the field, a chance to work in the store. Yeah. Um, but we try to have everybody have a focus and they try to, we try to improve them in that focus and help them succeed. We also have expectations for our employees, and one of the expectations we have is that they don't, their job is not just to maintain the farm, it's to improve whatever aspect of the farm they work in. Mm. And I, I find that empowerment that, you know, you're here to bring your brain and make this situation better than it is. And it also shows humbleness on our part that we admit that we don't have it all figured out, and we're hiring you to help us with that. That has been a huge empowerment for our employees. Um, and it's something simple. We just write it down and say, this is one of the expectations. And it just makes them engage their brain when they're at work. And that's been huge. And that keeps them making sure that they feel that they matter, that they not only are they there to carry the feed and, you know, catch the birds, but they also are in the bigger scheme of things, making the whole farm work more efficiently and be more profitable. Definitely. And then in a, in, if everything works as planned, that also reflects in their pay and whether or not they get an extra paid week vacation and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So talk to us about your marketing. You have a very unique location where you are. You have a farm store. Um, you sell basically one main product and then a whole lot of other regional products. Share with us a little bit about how that all works. Sure. So l let me just back up a little bit to the, to the our farm specifically. So we have Vernon Family Farm, which is the name of our farm, and that is the sort of the production and the marketing side of the farm that pertains to our fresh product. So whether it be a broiler, boneless breast, et cetera. We, in 24, uh, let's see, 2017, or 2018, we launched Wicked Chicken Rotisserie, mm -hmm. and that is our value add side of the business. So the Vernon family farm is very much sort of as the name says, it's a family business. It's a lot of sort of holistic family activities and, you know, family meals. The, ro the wicked chicken rotisserie is um, sort of the hipper, younger sibling. <laughs> okay. Of, okay. Of Vernon family farm. And that is where we focused on all the value add products. So we do rotisserie chickens, pot pies, soups, um, fried chicken nights, taco Tuesday, et cetera. So, we wanted to create two brands and the value add brand is a little slicker. It's a, it's min more minimal in yep. its approach. And what's interesting um, as a side note is that those three value add products, I'm going to guess in 2020 will in uh, net sales, sorry, in gross sales for retail only will surpass all of the other 
fresh products that we sell. Okay. And I think that's a sign of where the market is going, that convenience-based, ready-to-eat Absolutely. Product. Yeah. Um, so, so if you don't mind sharing, you said that will surpass, what percentage of the business is the wholesale to distributor part of that all? That is, uh, so Walden Meats is the name of our regional distributor that we sell our birds to. 40% of our birds go to them. Okay. So we do our birds in batches of 3,000 and we do six batches a summer. So 18,000, well, we're going to do 18,000 birds this year. Okay. And um, I think they're getting, yeah, around 8,000 of those birds. Then the rest will go to our retail and our own wholesale markets. Yep. Um, overall, if you took the total sales of the farm, it's roughly 50, 50 retail to wholesale. Okay. Um, but that with that wholesale number being driven by the Walden meets contract, if you took that contract out, it would be by far more retail than wholesale. Okay. That makes sense. So talk about the farm store. So how many different other, uh, farmers or artisans are you working with for that store? So we have over 30 different local makers and producers represented in the store. Um, like I said earlier, the store is located on a 35 mile an hour, relatively busy road in a wealthy community. Mm -hmm. We're surrounded by ho houses on all sides. So there's customers, you know, literally within hundreds of yards of the house yeah. uh, of the store. The other thing is a, every farm around here closes their farm store in the winter, but we don't. And we made that decision in the very beginning that we were going to be a year round operation. And we have definitely picked up a lot of customers by just being that convenience open daily, nine to six year round. Yeah. That has been a huge plus for us. The other thing is we, um, last year we transitioned to having the store fully manned all the time. Okay. And having an employee there, I think, is worth more than the cost of that employee because not only do you have someone there to just simply help with the actual transaction, but answering questions, helping, you know, in upselling product. I mean, I, I think it's, that has been a huge positive as well. And mm -hmm. a lot of the farms around here do self-serve or they have, you know, someone they're like, man, but they're only open three days a week. Customers yeah. don't buy that way anymore. Customers, no. I want chicken right now. I'm going to go buy chicken. Yeah. And we've adapted to that and, that has really increased the sales of the farm store. So now it's uh, quite busy. It's, it, the store does great. There's customers coming and going all day, every day, year round, even when the weather's bad. And I think that has been huge. And I, I know for a lot of the local producers and makers that we've become one of their better uh, vendors or better mm -hmm. sales outlets. And I think that's, that's great for them and it's great for us. So talk to me about the, um, the kinds of products you have. Do you do like spring transplants in there or is it mainly just food products? So we focus mostly on proteins. Um, there are some very successful large vegetable producing farms around here that do have farm stores. So in the, okay. heat of the summer when, you know, production's at its peak, it's hard for us to keep up with the quality and, and variety of product mm. that they have. We do buy in from them. But, you know, they have way more variety than we can, we can stock on our shelves. Yeah. So we focused on proteins, and we have the best protein selection in the region. So we have everything. We have um, grass-fed beef and bison, pastured pork, elk, red deer, lamb, chicken, wow. and turkey in the store. And that variety is, uh, you know, is not – I don't think there's any other farms close to us that have that much variety. So that was – sort of our focus. The other thing about proteins is that they're a year round product. Yeah. And that really allowed us to keep our store stocked with a substantial variety of stuff, even though it's the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a, a good decision as well. So the chicken, do you offer fresh chicken in season or is it all frozen in there? It's frozen in the winter. It's fresh in the summer. Um, when we process our birds, you have a two week window from the day they're processed to keep them fresh. And then yep. whatever is not sold out of that fresh inventory goes into frozen inventory. Mm -hmm. So this time of year, we're selling frozen inventory. A, a good thing for us is that we're actually outselling our production. So we've started to network and contract with other pasture poultry growers ah. to have them grow birds for us. And, um, and we're, this, this will be our first year doing that. So I'm curious to see how that goes this year, but I think it'll be a positive thing. It's going to help them grow their businesses and it's going to help us um, allow us to sort of increase our markets while we catch up on our production side. Absolutely. All right. So let's move into the, the Wicked Chicken brand. So yep. the rotisserie side, how did you get started with that? 
That was honestly uh, one of those moments where I was in a grocery store and I saw those rotisserie chicken and I thought everybody eats rotisserie chicken. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> we should do that. So um, a friend of mine had a, you know, very basic, you could only put 10 broilers on it at once, uh, smoker. Yep. So I borrowed that smoker from him and we did, you know, we sold 10 chickens every Friday or one Friday a month for the first summer we did it. And it sort of catch on and it kept growing and kept growing. And then in 2018, we went out and purchased a, a big smoker from American Barbecue Systems out of okay. um, Kansas City, Missouri. Yep. And that smoker allows us to do 50 chickens at once. And now we do it every Friday year round. So it's grab and go in the winter. And then in the summer, we last summer, we installed a patio on the farm with fire pits and a big yard. And yeah. Um, now people in the summer they come they grab their chicken they sit by a fire pit we have live music and we've sort of created a whole event series around the wicked chicken brand yeah and that has been a huge positive both from a financial standpoint and from a bringing new customers into the farm the rotisserie chicken is very unique it's not duplicated at another farm it's something unique to us to have the chicks be uh, on the farm raised here and then you can eat them here, I think is a very unique experience. Absolutely. All right. So talk to us about the pricing of the rotisserie. That is not necessarily a cheap product. No, we charge $9 a pound for the rotisserie chickens. You lose about 20% of the weight in the cook. Mm -hmm. So you have to increase the price substantially to make up for it. Uh, the volume that we sell, even at that price, greatly is it greatly increased the number of broilers that we have to keep in inventory. So yeah. You, to be that boneless breast was like the driving product of the farm and that still is our top selling item but the rotisserie chicken and now the broilers are all sort of following suit mm -hmm. the other thing is you know our peak production is in the summer people don't eat broilers in the summer they're they're grilling etc yeah so it's it's the, to have the broiler cooked as a rotisserie chicken ready to go increases those broiler sales in this time of year when they would normally go down mm -hmm. and um there's definitely some you know, just having a smoker and rotisserie chicken is, is sounds simple, but you know, we have to have all these NSF and UL listed hot boxes and storage containers. And, you know, that's a lot that goes yeah. around that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the reason I, I asked that is because, you know, if you go to, let's say a Costco, you can buy a rotisserie chicken for five bucks and your price is probably like five times that probably 20 to $25. Yes, it is. Correct. So, that's a great question. And I will say that I, we've come to the determination that yes, yes, we sell chicken, but what we're really selling is an authentic experience around buying that chicken. Mm -hmm. And I think, especially in an age where convenience seems to be the driving force for many consumers, you need to be creating a unique experience that cannot be delivered to somebody's door. Mm -hmm. You're selling and a story. Yes, exactly. So when someone comes to the farm and they see, you know, in quotes, the farmer cooking the rotisserie chicken that they had raised mm -hmm. and, you know, they go into the farm store and there's that rotisserie chicken right next to the boneless breasts and everything else. And if they want to walk around the farm, they see the chicks in the barn or the chickens out at pasture and then to sit around the fire and eat that. I mean, that whole experience, by the time you've done all of that, I don't think someone's even thinking about the $25 they spent on that chicken. Yeah. That's, that's the least of their concerns. Yeah. And I think that's, that's telling that story is key. Okay. So here's something I hear from farmers every day is that, uh, well, you know, that's great for them, but I don't want to have to do that on my farm. I don't want to have to create that experience. I don't want to have to cook that food. And I come back to them and say, well, that's what it, take, it may take to make you a profitable farm. Talk about that. Yeah. So I think there's a delicate balance between, you know, your personal morals and how you see your farm unfolding and what the customer and the markets demand. Mm. And we all need to be making decisions about where we flex and where we don't in that process. Both my wife and I are very social folks and having people on the farm is part of what we wanted to do from the beginning. So in that yeah. regard, that was not an issue for us. If you're not going to be doing large retail sales, then, you know, you have to be fortunate enough to find a, some sort of wholesale outlet that's going to allow you to move the volume you need to move. And I know for pastured proteins, especially, it's hard to come up with a price point that can then be sold on the distribution or wholesale markets. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I, I, I strongly suggest finding retail outlets for your product. Now, one thing we've done is there's a lot of farms around us, like you said, that don't want to have those retail customers yeah. on their farms. We'll do shares. So we'll basically say tonight, Short Creek Farm is going to do a takeover of our farm. They're going to come and use our smoker on our farm. So we already have a bathroom and the whole parking and everything figured out to accommodate two, 300 people coming through the farm mm -hmm. and even and they don't have that infrastructure, but they just want access to those markets once in a while, and they'll come and do a feature at the farm. And that's, you know, that's been a really good collaboration to have that oh, type yeah. of takeover happen. Oh, very interesting. And obviously, you don't have to share exact numbers, but do you do like a revenue share, or do you do like a, one, a flat fee for people to use your place? So um, for that, what we do is we charge an entry fee, uh, um, we being Burns okay. Family Farm, yep. mm -hmm. and that cover is minimal, and we keep the cover, and then the customers will pay out of their pocket for the food that they eat. Okay, and, yes. And that just goes directly to whatever farm or chef, because we partner with chefs and restaurants as well, that's taking over the smoker for that day. Okay, that is brilliant. Yeah, it works incredibly well. So we've done fried chicken nights with local chefs. We'll do a Taco Tuesday with a local chef. And, you know, they keep the product coming off the, the, the food that they provide. But, you know, we get access to their customer base. We charge the cover charge and everybody seems to be happy. Awesome. So talk to me about the mental game. You know, starting a farm is always challenging, you know, trying to figure that out. Was there a specific time or like moment that you realized, oh, we, we're making it, it's going to work? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say a specific moment, but there was definitely this sort of, you know, you, you pause for a moment and you look over at your partner, you know, in this case, my wife and I, you know, this isn't quite as hard is it, as it used to be. And, uh -huh. and that those are really nice moments. Yeah. Um, when we first started, I can remember moments of opening up my bank accounts and just thinking, how is next week going to happen? Uh -huh. And yet it does. And I remember this emotional moment where I remember, or where I decided I'm not going to worry anymore about whether or not next week's going to happen. Cause it seems to keep happening anyway. <laughs> um, and it sounds simple, but that was a hard mental space to get into, to just relinquish that type of uh, concern. Mm. When our, when our, this is sort of a little of a tangent, but we do a lot of online and social media um, marketing. Yes. Yeah. I see a number of videos of yours and Instagrams and. Yeah. And what we found is once we got to the, a thousand followers on both Instagram and Facebook, if you did calls to action, you would actually have concrete results. So for example, we would say things like it's a CSA weekend, come purchase a CSA at Vernon family farm on the farm. That meant nothing. You know, we were still open daily nine to six, regardless of whether or not yeah. it's a CSA weekend. But then all of a sudden, five people would show up and buy a CSA. And that really was a turning point for us, where if you could do some sort of call to action online and get direct financial output as a result of that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I know that for a lot of people, including myself, social media is not a passion of theirs. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for me, it is a passion of my wife's. Okay. Um, and I don't personally have a Facebook or Instagram, and I, I don't go on the farms very often either. But uh, the online world has been a key to our success. And yeah. I, I would highly recommend farmers do not ignore that part of their business. So you're saying if you don't personally want to do it, just partner with someone who can manage that for you. Yeah, I think like many farms, identify what you're good at and keep doing that. And then if you're fortunate enough to build up your business in a way that you can either partner or pay someone to do what you're not good at, it'll make a world of difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There so, go ahead. I would say there are some farms around us that don't do that, but they have, they're basically only wholesale driven. They yeah. don't have retail customers at all. Yeah. Okay. So another thing is that you kind of broke the mold with doing the value added. Was there a, and you said you just started that slowly. And so that just kind of like you stepped out a little bit. Again, you kind of did a shotgun approach and now you've kind of lasered in and you're firing cannonballs as let's say like a uh, Jim Collins would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, um, the value add was another one of those sort of just like, you know, if you're standing at the farmer's market and you look down at all the vendors, which vendors have the most people shopping with them? And I kept looking, you know, here we have these full producers who are doing, you know, high quality product, good volume, and the value add vendors are, you know, 10, 20 people waiting in line. Yeah. 
And I just kept getting frustrated by that. And instead of just complaining about it, we decided that we were going to, as a farm, become a value add business as well. And mm -hmm. um, that was simply just observing and then reacting to that ob observation. And when we started that process, it was pretty janky. You know, it was my friend's backyard smoker. You had to show up at a certain time. You had to make reservations. It was pretty clunky. Yeah. And, you know, I think you just have to accept that when you're starting something new, it's not going to be the sleek thing you want it to be. And then you just got to keep working hard at it. And eventually it does get you know, polished and becomes a little bit more uh, sexy than it was before. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that was just a, you know, an observation and then a direct focus on let's make that part of our business. The rotisserie chicken was the focus. What's been interesting is, you know, what we, we kept having a few, we'd always start making more and more rotisserie chicken and then we started to have some extra. So we, that was what started the pot pies and the soup. Mm -hmm. And now the pot pie is, you know, I think our fourth top selling item, period, if you include everything we do. Wow. So if you just keep persevering and trying hard, you know, you'll, you stumble upon things you didn't expect you'd be doing. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is just do it scared and do it clunky. Just get out and start. Yeah, especially if you're starting small, because the risk is so minimal. You know, I mean, this was mm -hmm. a borrowed smoke. I mean, all I was doing was buying a few rotisserie containers from the Hannafords, the local supermarket. Yeah. I just would go buy containers from them for, they were just selling them for like $1 for 20 of them. <laughs> yeah. And I'd get a couple things of charcoal and borrow my friend's smoker and, and then no labels or anything. I'm sure it was not legal <laughs> the way we were <laughs> doing it to start. But, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, that was... Uh, that was just how we started. And now it's, you know, we, we get inspected by the health department yeah. and all the other stuff, you know? So. Yeah. So what is the biggest mistake that you see beginning farmers making? I would say beginning farmers don't spend enough time identifying what the market needs. A lot of farmers come into farming from the experiences they've had, which I don't blame them, but you know, for example, there are four large veggie producers around us that have been doing it for over 10 years you know, they all have different production standards, whether it be organic or conventional or non-GMO or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever they've decided. And when we started doing veggies, I remember setting up at the farmer's market and, you know, looking down the line and then like that person's tomatoes look way better than mine. And yeah. you know, why am I growing tomatoes if they have hundreds of tomatoes that are better than mine? So, you know, as a farmer, do some market analysis first. Go work at the farmer's market for another farm. Just walk around the farmer's market, visit some restaurants, see what farms are listed on the menu and what they're sourcing locally, and then figure out why they're not being sourced locally if they're not. So for us, with the chicken, you know, we said, why aren't you buying chicken? They said, well, no one's doing USDA processed chicken. Yeah. And, you know, and then it was, oh, well, then let's, let's do USDA processed chicken. So I think, you know, market research is something that is missed. A lot of farmers have experience growing veggies, so they just start growing veggies. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to do more research than that. Yeah. I just talked to a farmer a couple yesterday who added salad dressings and now it's a massive part of their business because no one was doing salad dressings. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think once you get in it, you can, it's, it's easier to see all the different, you know, where there's opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's that initial uh, evaluation that can be the hardest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? I do love tractors. Um, <laughs> My favorite, well, how about this? I don't know if you're, it's my favorite. We just bought these two, three and a half ton mobile grain carts okay. from, from Feed Train. And yeah. they, if you had seen the old ones we were using, which were one ton each, the old ones were definitely a hazard. <laughs> they were not safe to use. They had broken, uh, broken welds on them and everything. These new ones are solar powered with augers. We can auger the grain right into the pasture pens. And it is slick. My employees love using them. They look really nice behind the John Deere tractor. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. So that's the best. And then the other thing too is your chicken pens too. You have, they're like small hoop houses, correct? Yeah, they are. So um, a lot of people might have heard the MRCs, the mobile range coops. Yeah. Yep. Um, our fields are quite a bit smaller in acreage than a lot yeah. of the other growers. So those mobile range coops would be too large for our fields. So we did our own version of that. And um, ours are like mobile. Yeah, they're hoop style. And they're on uh, wooden skids. So we just skid them around. Yep. And we, we probably overbuilt them a little bit, but we built them so that we could actually hang 
uh, 1,000 pounds of feed and then mount these 300 gallon water totes on them. Because, you know, for us, it was like, let's eliminate as much of the chore time as possible so that we can focus on the details of making sure that our, our grit change days are correct on that our feed change days are correct. And all of our yeah. micronutrients, you know, focus on those details by getting rid of the time of just filling a five gallon bucket and dumping it out. Yeah. Um, okay. So how are you moving these then with a tractor? Yeah. So we, uh, one downside of ours is it takes two people. One person pulls the coop with the, uh, the pasture yep. pen with a tractor. And then we use a kayak paddle and you just sort of, ah. the, just sort of like, you know, you're just basically just making sure the chickens move ahead. Yeah. Tapping um, them. Yeah. And that whole process, you can move one pasture pen in less than a minute. So it doesn't take long. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Very interesting. Yeah. I know that's just such a, that is like the, the sticking point. Cause I, again, spent a, a summer at Polyface moving their, their pens. <laughs> yeah. And their pens were our first pens. Their, their style. Ah, yep. It was, we did a little variation on our own, but their style of, you know, size and dimensions, et cetera. That was what we were doing too. Yeah. Gotcha. So do you believe that now is the best time to be starting a farm? Hmm. I think now is a great time to start a farm in certain areas. <laughs> I okay. Think there, yeah. I think with a caveat, I, one of the concerns that I have uh, up here in New England is that we've run into this. There's no redundancy in the farming infrastructure, the greater farming infrastructure. So approach with caution, I guess is what I'm saying. So for example, there's only one USDA processing facility yes. less than five hours away from our farm. You know, there's only two grain companies that will, that will provide non-GMO grain to us. So yes, I think there's opportunities still in the local farming business, community, but I think that we are in a point now with our business that we need to start developing or finding redundancies because too much of our liability now falls in the hands of a single vendor or something yeah. like that. And they went out of business, there'd be a big problem. Yeah. I mean, I think without Commonwealth poultry, we wouldn't, I mean, I don't even want to think what we would have to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, I think there's definitely opportunity. There's um, an issue with cost of land. Um, yeah. Land prices are only going up. So finding creative ways to get on land and get on secure land. I, I remember at the fruit and veggie growers conference, I was in one of the fruit growers conferences and the average age of the fruit growers was 65, 70 years old. And someone made the comment that, you know, fruit production is a five, 10 year or longer investment. And mm -hmm. a lot of young growers don't have security on land that they can feel comfortable making that type of investment in. Yeah. And so, I think the older vent growers are stopping to make the investment because, well, you know, I'm, I'm 70 years old. I'm going to retire in two or three years. I don't want to plant a tree that's going to take 10 years. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you have some fabulous fruit growers really close to you as well. We do. Yeah. There's, uh, there's actually a fruit grower butternut farm up in Farmington. And um, I was told recently by uh, one of the local uh, UNH Cooperative Extension folks that they have the most profitable farm per acre in the state. Um, Interesting. They, yeah, and they do. I mean, I, I'm not surprised. Their business is very tight, very clean, and well done. Okay, and the name of that farm again was? Butternut Farm. And his name is Giff. He's definitely worth talking to. He, um, he grew up on an orchard in Maine, and uh, he's a UNH graduate, and he and his wife and their family, and yeah, they do a very nice job. And they just added uh, hard cider to their... Uh, very yes. cool. Yeah. So where can people find out more about you and your work? Well, we just, just launched our new website. I think it's getting launched today, actually, which, oh, is, uh, awesome. which is great. Yeah. So our new website will be published today. Uh, Facebook and Instagram are very uh, maintained and used. My wife is, does a great job with that. The farm store is open daily, nine to six, and is, uh, you know, like we talked about, fully stocked with all sorts of local goods and our summer event series is all published on our website and you can, you know, pick one of the fun events. The fried chicken nights are exceptionally uh, busy and fun and uh, come get a biscuit dipped in butter and some deep fried chicken thighs. Oh, that does sound good. It is. Okay. Well, Jeremiah, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. And we know the audience will as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it. And that's a wrap with Jeremiah. Next week on the podcast, we'll talk to Jason Hertz, who is a farmer out in Missouri. Now, Jason farms only under tunnels, 
growing baby salad greens for a number of local restaurants and grocery stores. He talks about the early years of struggling as a farmer, how he started to scale up his farm, and how they made a decision to move to 100% covered space. We also talk about managing disease for tunnel lettuce and some of the techniques he's worked with to decrease his disease drastically. So join me next week and we will chat with Jason. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer Podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.